will hear her jumble. What if you could become a millionaire without having to win the lottery or change jobs or dramatically scale back on your lifestyle? It sounds like a pipe dream, but best-selling author and financial advisor David Bach says that anyone can do it if they follow a few simple, pain-free steps. His new book is called The Automatic Millionaire. Now, I have to believe that one of the reasons that the advice you offer in, in your book is so successful is that it starts from a very contrarian premise, one that most of us don't accept, and that, that is that you don't need a big cash flow or a big salary to accumulate big net worth. Right. Tell me about that. When you open up the book, you, you learn about a couple called Jim and Sue McIntyre. And this is actually based on a real couple. And what happened was I was a brand new financial advisor. This is in the early 90s and I was teaching investment seminars. And this couple came up to me at the end of the seminar and said, we want to come into your office and discuss retirement. You know, I'm 52 years old and I'd like to retire. Well, I looked at them and I judged a book by its cover. You know, this guy Jim had on a short sleeve dress shirt, a pocket protector with these pens. He didn't look like somebody who could retire at the age of 52. And he had told me in the class that he'd never really made over $50,000 a year. So when he came into my office, my first thought was, this is going to quite frankly be a wasted meeting. I'm going to have to tell these guys that there's just no way they can retire. And they proceeded to show me their asset statement. They own two homes free and clear. They have over a million dollar nest egg, saved up. And they have two cars paid off and a boat paid off. And I start looking at how much money they make, and they've never made over $55,000 ever. Average income was about $30,000 during their lifetime. And here they are in their early 50s able to retire. Well, let's talk about how the McIntyres became autom yes. autom automatic millionaires. So, the first principle, pay yourself first. Explain that. They were told by their parents, as many of us have been told, that the first person who needs to be paid when you get a paycheck is you. The opposite of what a lot of people do is they try to budget. Budgeting doesn't work. The McIntyres threw the budget out the window. They sat down and they took the first hour a day of their income and they paid themselves first. Now, what that means for somebody who's watching this show is it's the same thing. You take the first hour of income and you have it directly put into your RRSP. But the beauty of what the McIntyres did, and this is what other people need to do, is they automated it so that they didn't touch the money. In other words, what we receive, we spend. We spend it on taxes, we spend it on our landlord, our rent, credit cards, utilities, you name it. They had the money taken right off the top and they had it go into their RRSP and then they had to go into a home that they bought. And so the magic of what they did is there was no discipline required. And that's the key to the automatic millionaire. It is taking discipline off the table 
and making it completely automatic. That if you put this money away, your lifestyle will conform to your free cash flow, you won't miss it? Is that basically what you're saying? And that is what I'm saying, and that is the truth. You know, the, I'm not telling you that you can't have anything. I'm not suggesting that you put off all things you want to do with your life so that someday you can retire and have money. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is if you're going to work 10 hours a day, which most people are doing right now, they're working at least eight, you should keep the first hour a day of your income. That's the first step to being an automatic millionaire. Even if you don't believe you can save an hour a day of your income, then save 30 minutes. The average Canadian right now, based on statistics, is saving less than 10 minutes a day of their income. Think about that for a second. That's, that's, that's crazy. Now, putting money away either in savings or RRSP, I mean, can make you a millionaire because of the miracle of compounding. Right. Tell me how that works. What well, the miracle of compound interest is, is that a small amount of money put away, if you continually do that over a period of time, grows to be a fortune. I talk about in the book the latte factor. Because I've had a lot of people say, David, I don't have any money. And I don't have any money to save. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. So I started asking people, can you save $5 a day? Well, the answer is yes, because a lot of us are spending $5 a day on lattes, mm -hmm. literally. They're going and they're getting a latte, or they're going and getting bottled water, or they're going and getting cigarettes, whatever the case may be, 5 to $10 a day. You put that away in an RSP. You let it compound. At 10% interest, over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you go from having tens of thousands of dollars in savings to hundreds to over a million dollars in savings. Now, this is why we tell our children to start investing in an yes. RSP early. What do you tell someone, and, and, and there are legions of them now, right. who are kind of in midlife, who are saying, you know, I really haven't been doing that. I don't have anything in an RSP. I don't have any savings. The miracle of compounding doesn't work yeah, for me. I've only got 10 me. years. Well, uh, here's what I say to people, and I get this question a lot now. I had a woman the other day come up to me. She was 52 years old. And she said, David, I went and I met with a planner. And that I spent $500 on this plan. And the planner basically told me that if I want to retire at 62, I need to save $2,000 a month. And she said, I'm only making about $50,000 a year. So basically what he told me is I have to save 75% of my paycheck. So she said, I walked out of that office, aggravated that I spent the money, and discouraged. So I haven't done anything. What do you think? And I looked at her and I said, let me ask you an honest question. Can you save $10 a day? She said, yeah. I said, are you married? Yeah. Can he save $10 a day? Yes. I said, let's start there. Because that means you'll be saving almost $7,500. So if the two of you do that and you use your RSP, which happened that their companies had a match, I calculated out the numbers for her. I said, realistically, you're going to have to work past 62. You'll probably work until your late 60s. But guess what? You do this, you'll still have at least two, three, maybe $400,000 in savings. Now, wouldn't it be better to have $400,000 in savings than nothing? She said, absolutely. I said, why, do, why don't we do that? Because the planners aren't explaining it that way. They're not sitting down and saying, guess what? $10 a day can change your life. They're making it too complicated. People who are reading the Automatic Millionaire book right now are saying to me, this is the easiest book I've ever read on money. Why didn't they teach this in school? Is there a psychological predisposition on the other way? They say, you know what? OK, the latte factor, spending big bucks on little right. things. That's what makes life pleasurable. I need that latte. I can't think about 20 years from I, now. There, there, you know, a lot of people push back on that. I was just on Oprah Winfrey's show, and we had people track their latte expenses for a week right. and, and, and submit them. And then we had some of these people on the show. And one woman's latte factor for the month was over $1,100. And Oprah rolled out this cart and showed her, you know, if you just cut out like $7 a day, you'd have, and the, she had real cash, mm -hmm. over $288,000. And this girl was in her early 30s, making very good money, and she had less than $10,000 in savings. And it was sort of like a light bulb moment of, look, you don't have to give it all up. You can still get your nails done. You can still get a massage. Just give up a little something so that you can have a lot later. The other thing that often stands in our, in our way of making uh, savings or investing in RRSPs uh, is whatever debt we've accumulated, yeah. especially credit card uh, debt. Now, you make a very interesting point here that runs again against a lot of the notions is that you don't have to pay all your debt off first before you can start saving. Explain how that works. Yeah, it's amazing how bad advice has been given for so long. You know, have a budget. Okay, it doesn't work, but that's the advice that's always been given. Yeah, you're against budgets. You just Completely. say forget it. Second, Make it automatic. Second advice people are always given is pay off your credit card debt first, then save. It's horrible advice because when you meet with somebody who has credit card debt, if they focus all their energy on paying off their credit card debt and their student loans, they may have to wait 10 to 15 years 
to start saving. Mm -hmm. So they've lost all those years of compound interest. More importantly, they get depressed because they're working for 10 years just to get themselves out of a hole. They never see themselves making progress. Then they never get excited about investing. I say this is what you do. You pay down your debt and you save for the future at the same time. Split it 50-50. Split it 50-50. You have $100 that you can put away a month. You put 50 towards debt and 50 towards the future. You shrink that debt and you build the future at the same time. And people who do this, they come back to me three, four, five years later and they go, you know what, that was the best thing I ever did because as my debt was shrinking, I was also seeing my savings go up, so I was feeling good about myself. You also have advice for people who feel that they, they, that they are being crushed under the burden of 18% interest yes. rates on credit cards. What should I do if I've got you know, all this debt in, on, on my credit There's card? There's a series of things that you can do that are free. You can pick up the phone, for starters, and call your credit card company and tell them that you're not going to take it anymore. Speak to a supervisor and say, listen, I just got a credit card application in the mail. Now, you're not getting bombarded as bad in Canada as we are in the U.S., but you are being, a lot, yeah. you are being bombarded. Open up that mail. They're offering right now low-interest credit cards, sometimes anywhere from 0 to 6%. Your current credit card company will lower your interest rate on the phone, I would tell you, 7 out of 10 times hmm. if you've been paying your bills on time, right. just by asking. We've done radio shows live where we've been, gone on the phone and got the credit card company to go from 18% down to 5% wow. in less than five minutes. So they'll, they'll deal, they'll negotiate. They will deal. And if you don't get the first person to deal, ask to speak to the next person. Call back the next week. We had a woman recently who was at 29%. She went down to 18%. I said, well, call them back next week and go from 18% down to 12 And She looked at me and she's like, you can do this? I said, listen, it's a game. This is a game. Money is a game. Business is a game. You just have to play it to win. She's the line like, of credit. She's like, I can do that. <laughs> the line of credit. Yeah. Is that an option? Line of credit on the home? No, a line of credit, a personal line of credit to consolidate my, uh, my credit card debt. It is an option. The problem is, and again, this is a, a problem in the U.S., and you're starting to see it in Canada right now. The problem is people are pulling equity out of their house to pay off their credit card debt. Mm. And guess what? They pay off their credit card debt, and they feel good for a few weeks, and a year later, they're right back in credit card debt. So I would tell you that that's not the best option, because in most cases, you're pulling equity out of your house, you're building up another loan again, and you're just moving one debt to another debt. The second big cornerstone of your plan, after paying yourself first, is get into the housing market, own a home. You have to. Why is that so important? Home ownership is the secret to all wealth in North America, period. If you are a renter, you are making someone rich, your landlord. If you're making your landlord rich, you're making yourself poor. The, the thing that blew me away when we made this book, you know, we Canadianized this book. This book came out in the U.S., but we also Canadianized mm -hmm. it at the same time so that all your tax laws and statistics were covered. The Canadian statistic in 1999, the last time we had data for it, was that the average homeowner was worth almost $140,000. The average renter in Canada had a net worth of less than two grand. So we, 70 times difference. Isn't that unbelievable? Now, in the U.S., it's like 4000 for a renter and over 140000 for homeowners. So I have a whole chapter in this book on how to go from being a renter to a homeowner. And the good news for Canadians is that's easier right now for you to become a homeowner because you have special tax laws that allow you to borrow up to $20,000 out of your RRSP account mm -hmm. if you're single. If you're married, you can borrow up to $40,000. And the Canadian government allows you 15 years to pay that back. Well, that's where you get your down payment. So you pay yourself first, you use your RRSP for a few years, then you take that money out and you go buy your first home. And I will tell you, when you talk to your parents or your grandparents, they will tell you that the best investment they ever made was their home. So before you worry about, should I go back in and buy Nortel right now? Don't worry about the price of Nortel. Go buy a home. You hear people talk yes. about being house poor. Is it wise to get into the market even it's, if you're carrying a big, big It's gun? not wise to buy too big of a home. You don't want to see your mortgage and your cost for that house exceed 35% of your income. Mm. So whatever your income is, you don't want to go past the 35% mark. A lot of people are up to 50. That's a little too high. But I will tell you that if, if, if it's a difference between renting or buying a home with 5% down, buy a home with 5% down. You also offer a surprisingly uh, simple uh, advice, and that is pay your mortgage off bi-weekly yes. rather than monthly. Now, someone say, well, what difference could that make? This is an amazing, simple thing that you can do that will basically reduce your debt 
tremendously. Okay, so you buy a home. Your mortgages here are 25 years long. U.S. they're 30 years long. You take your mortgage payment, whatever it is. Let's just use $1,000 as an sure. example. You split it in half, $500 every two weeks. So you're paying your mortgage basically when you get paid, mm -hmm. which makes your cash flow easier anyway. They make it automatic because they pull the money out of your checking account for you to go towards the mortgage. That takes a 25-year mortgage down to 20 years. You shave five years off of that mortgage. And you save, on average, in Canada, over $46,000 in interest payments. Now, the reason this works is that there's 52 weeks in a year. So you end up making, without really realizing it, one extra payment right. a year. And it's very important, I understand, that you tell the bank that the, this additional payment is going for principal, not interest. Absolutely. And in fact, I'll tell you something. When you make that extra payment and it goes towards the principal, not only do you have to make sure you tell them, but you need to document it. Because one thing people don't know is that some of these banks take that extra payment and they put it in a holding tank. They actually have a holding tank account for extra interest payments. So again, it's a scam. You've got to make sure that that extra money goes towards principal because that's how you get that mortgage reduced. Now, I know that you and others say pay off that mortgage as quickly as you can as part of that debt-free strategy. Yeah. But there's another school of thought that says, you know, interest rates are so low right, right now. I should have the fat of mortgages I right. can. The cost of money has never been uh, less. And take even, even remortgage my property. Right. Take that extra money and get into the stock market and deduct that those interest payments. The stock market's not guaranteed. Debt-free is guaranteed. You can always pull that money out later and go invest it if you want to. So I just think it's a great goal. Now, I don't tell people to pay off their mortgage in one lump sum. Mm -hmm. I'm just suggesting take that 25-year mortgage and pay it off in 20 years. What the McIntyres did, which I think is brilliant, is they paid off one home. So they bought a home in their early 20s and they were debt-free by their 40s. And instead of spending that extra cash flow, they rented their first home bought a second home, paid that home off early. So that by the time they reached their 50s, they owned two homes free and clear. One was a rental property, one they lived in. Great strategy. Now, since the stock market crash of uh, spring of 2000, uh, I mean, many of us are still pretty puck shy yeah. about getting into, puck shy, in, like into the so hockey, hockey that, measure, yeah. about getting, getting into the equity markets. But against that, you look and you say, you know, the, the, the real, you know, Stable investments, GICs and right. what have you, are 3%. I know. I mean, the kind of returns that you're talking about are really accumulating significant uh, wealth. You know, are closer to 10. Yeah. What do you do with your extra investment cash flow that doesn't put your fundamental savings at risk? Really good question. Let me just explain something because this is what really ruins people's lives financially. They try, they go back and forth. It's like going, have you ever been like in the, in the grocery store and you have your cart? and you're in the aisle, and your aisle just stops, and you look over there and you go, that, that aisle's moving. So you move to the other yes. aisle, and then you get in the other aisle, and that aisle stops, and the aisle that you were in just goes speeding right through. It happens in the cars, too. I call that lane switching. People do that with investments. They go from all their money in GICs to the stock market's taking off, like it just mm -hmm. did last year, and they put all their money in the stock market. Then the moment they get in the stock market, the stock market crashes. They go, ah, oh, I knew that was a mistake. They go back to GICs. They're always going backwards and you know, back and forth. Here's what you do. You build a boring financial life. And let me tell you how you build a boring financial life that works. You put about 30% of your money into GICs, guaranteed investments. Then you put another 30% of your money into real estate, like your home or rental property. And that leaves you with another 40%. And you put that money into the stock market. And you buy an index fund and you put some of that in the Canadian stock market because you have to, mm -hmm. and you put the rest that you're allowed to into the global index fund. So that guess what? You got total diversification on the stock market, you got real estate in your portfolio, and you got guaranteed investments. Over time, that breakdown, 30, 30, and 40, produces roughly somewhere between 8 to 11% a year. But there's different strategies depending on where you are in, uh, in life and your age, is there not? There is, and as people get older, you always hear you need to be more conservative. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people who are older haven't saved a lot of money. And so people who are in their 50s, guess what? You are not at the end of your life now. You're really in the middle because a lot of people 50 today are going to live to be 100. They really are. You know, my grandmother lived to be 86. And right before she had a stroke and passed away, she was an 86-year-old active young woman, you know, hiking five miles a day, 
going out on three dates, three nights a week with three different men. You know, my, my grandfather passed away in his early 70s. My grandmother lived almost 20 years later than mm -hmm. him. She moved to Leisure World, California, where there's 29,000 women and like 400 men, which is a little bit of an exaggeration, but not a huge exaggeration. And she had the money to enjoy her retirement. She was buying growth stocks, growth, growth stocks at 86 years old. Now, she had guaranteed investments also, right. but she was still looking for investment opportunities in 86. We're, we're finally seeing uh, a return to mutual funds. You know, the market is still a little yeah. dodgy, but there's money going into it. Are you a big fan of uh, managed money, of, uh, of investing in mutual funds? I'm a big fan of having your money be boring. So here's what's really boring. Index funds. Right. You know, buying an index fund. These ones fund, that track the stock yeah, market. Yeah, the ones index. that track the stock market, they're totally diversified and they're going to match the market. And here's the truth. And people hate to hear this because I was a money manager. The reality is it's very hard to outperform the stock market. Mm -hmm. Very rarely are you able to do it. So I see nothing wrong with matching the stock market. And if I'm going to try and buy an actively managed mutual fund that you know, will potentially outperform the stock market, then I want a fund that's been around for over 20 years that's got a track record that can prove to me that they've got the ability to outperform the stock market. But quite frankly, matching the stock market should be just fine. And I'll tell you what, after situations like Nortel, or you know, in the United States we had Enron or WorldCom, after these great companies wiped out so many people's financial nest eggs, I'll never bet personally money on individual stocks in a big way ever again. I don't think you should have more than 5% of your net worth in one company's so stock. Diversification is important as part of that, uh, that yeah. strategy. Now, uh, an another book, you offer financial advice specifically to women. Yes. What kind of advice do women need or do you offer that's different than you would than you would Well, do Smart today? Women Finish Rich was the first book I ever wrote. I wrote that book because I learned about money from my grandmother. My grandmother started at 30 with absolutely nothing, became a self-made millionaire taught my family how to invest, helped me buy my first stock at age seven. I thought all women were like Grandma Bach, you know, the one managing the money at home. What I found out though is that women often don't manage the money. And here's what I can tell you as a woman. The financial plan for your family is more important for you than your husband. Because realistically, if your family runs out of money, you'll be the one to find out. Your husband won't, because your husband won't live as long as you will. The women living are living an average of seven to 10 years longer than men, but mm. the truth is that women marry older men in many cases. Sure. So your retirement as a woman could be 10, 20, 30 years longer than your counterpart. And yet, because you take time off from work to have kids, you end up with less money in retirement accounts. So it's a double whammy. For women, you gotta save more money than men. What do you think is the biggest single mistake women make financially? if they're single, putting off buying a home. Mm. Y you meet women, because today women are getting married later. So women in their 20s should be looking to buy a home. But I'll meet women in their 20s and even their early 30s who are not married and they say, yeah, but I, I'm going to wait until I get married. I'm, I'm going to wait to deal with this until I'm married. Well, guess what? First of all, you might not get married. Second of all, you'll never meet a man that says that. Men don't say, oh, I'm not going to buy a home until I get married. And the reason men have more money than women is not that they're earning more. It's that they start investing sooner. So as a woman, I will tell you, don't put off investing. Use your RSP immediately and buy a home immediately. Those are the two smartest things you can do. The other kind of lifestyle change that has financial impl implications is that it seems that our children are dependent on yes. us much, much later, well into adulthood. They're going to university uh, more and that this creates, again, a financial, uh, if not obligation, certainly burden on, on us parents. How do you pay yourself first? when you seem to be stuck in a rut of right. paying your kids first. They call the, you know, it's the boomerang yeah. generation. You, you throw these kids out in the world, they, you pay for them to go off to school, to university, and then they come back. So I tell parents, look, you have to have an honest conversation with your kids. You have to say, mom and dad can no longer give you money. And here's why. We don't want to live with you for the rest of your life. See, at some point, if we don't have money put aside, you'll have to be the one who has a job, and we'll be staying at your house. So mom and dad want to have enough money to have our own retirement, and we don't want to be a financial burden to you, which believe me, you don't want us to be a financial burden to you. So it's now time for you to go off and get a job, and pay for your home, and pay for your food. This is what mommy and daddy did, and now it's your turn. <laughs> Now, you, you start the book with the inspirational story of the McIntyres who have been able to accumulate this significant uh, wealth without huge, huge cash right. flow. But what about the opposite side, especially people who are right on the brink of retirement and they look and they just say, you know, I don't, I, and I think you make the point, you know, only about one in, one in five people have enough savings right. to retire and maintain the lifestyle 
they had while, while, while they were working. What advice do you give to someone at that station in life? Okay, first of all, again, the retirement advice that's been, been given for the last 10 years is just really poor. You keep hearing over and over again that when you retire, you're going to need 70 to 80 percent of what you make. Mm -hmm. So if you're making, let's just use $100,000 as an example a year, you'll only need $70,000 a year in income at retirement. Well, first of all, it's ridiculous. It's not true. When people retire, you know what the first thing they want to do? What would you guess the first thing somebody wants to do when they retire? Go on a cruise or have a, have they want, a, they, a winter home in they, Canada. They want to travel or they want to buy a second home. There's all these things they want to do. They've been working for two or three or four decades. They're ready to go party. Mm -hmm. They may be in their 60s, but they're ready to go play. You'll spend more money in the first, second, or third year of retirement. Some cases, 100, 150, 200 percent. So here's what you need to know. If you really think you're going to live off of less retirement, don't guesstimate it. Practice it. We had our clients where I used to work. I had my own investment group at Morgan Stanley. We used to have our clients practice retirement for six months. So instead of just doing a retirement projection that said, okay, here's your amount of money and it'll produce $50,000 a year in income, we'd say, if you're telling us that you can live off of $50,000 a year in income, then we want you to practice doing that for six months. At the end of six months, come back into our office and tell us if it worked. Then you know you're ready to retire. The clients that listened to us and practiced doing that had a really enjoyable retirement because they knew that they could, they could do it, they didn't have to worry. The ones that didn't practice it are the ones that got into big surprises. Believe it or not, we've seen people save a half a million dollars for retirement and go through all of it in 10 years. Hmm. And now you're 70, so you retired at 60 and you're 70 and you went through a half a million dollars, and now what do you do? When you could live to, to, to 90. Well, you, you're the financial advisor. Give me an answer to that question. Well, uh, you know, we just did a makeover for a couple. And I have a show in the States called Simplify Your Life that I do, where we do makeovers. And we did a makeover for a wonderful couple, 70 and 71, live in a beautiful home, have all the nice clothes, had a nice lifestyle, had a half a million dollar retirement nest egg, and went through it in 11 years. They're down to $50,000. And you know what they're having to do? Sell their home. Mm -hmm. And we had to show, you know, they're going to have some money when they sell this home, fortunately, because this home's gone up in value a lot. Right. But they're having to sell their home and move to a much, much smaller place in a neighborhood that's not where their friends are. And it's going to be a tough adjustment for them. And the look in their eyes as we went around with these camera crews doing reality TV, showing them what they're going to have to go live in, was brutal. What should have they done? Well, they really should have practiced retirement. And they made the fatal mistake that retirees make. They lived off of 10% of their nest egg a year. Mm. So they had a half a million dollars. When the market was going up at 20% clicks, they would say, oh, geez, you know, a half a million dollars made 100 grand this year. So they would spend 100 grand. Well, then the market went down and they kept spending at that rate. Hmm. And that's how you can go through a nest egg in five to ten years. Finally, uh, you say that even if you aren't a millionaire, you could feel like one by a simple process of tithing, allocating again a small portion of your free cash flow to charity. Yes. Given how much difficulty everyone has in just savings, I mean, what purpose could this uh, particular well, solve? Well, first of all, the Automatic Millionaire book ends with the chapter on tithing. And it ends on the chapter on tithing because, honestly, this book is not about just being a millionaire. The truth is that what money does is it buys you your freedom. It buys you your freedom to spend your energy on what matters most to you, which is hopefully your family, your friends. It's also your community. And I honestly believe with all my heart that it's not just about making yourself rich, it's about taking part of what you make and giving it back to help others. Now, I don't tell you in this book, oh, you should tithe, you should give back to your community or your church 10% of your income, which so many people do. I just suggest that something that comes to you should go back. And if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you start just giving a little bit away, first pay yourself first, then give a little bit away, what you'll see is that it comes back to you tenfold. I really believe that. You make the world a better place and good things happen.
Gloria Jungle. Could switching to GEICO really save you 15% or more on car insurance? Did the little piggy cry wee, wee, wee all the way home? Wee! Wee, wee, wee! 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 Max. Wait, wait, wait! Maxwell! Yeah? You're home. Oh, cool. Thanks, Mrs. A. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Hi guys, it's Rachel and I'm here with Michelle. Hi guys. And for today's episode of Haul or Nothing, which is a show inspired by your personal shopping experiences, we had someone from YouTube. Yes, um, her name is Fiercely Fabulous. Love it, fearless. <laughs> and her comment, well, just a couple of weeks ago, my friend Jasmine and I wanted to do some back to school shopping for wild clothing, but we didn't want to spend a lot of money. So we ended up going to a hand-me-down slash Navy surplus store and found really cool stuff there with our budget of just $50 each. Let's try Let's it. Let's do it. Awesome. Sounds like fun. Let's, Let's go. go. All right, fiercely fabulous. <laughs> So here we go. Yes, we are open. We're headed in. Because we are going inside. And we have to push. Push, push. Whoa. Here we are. Oh my goodness. It's like, this is a store that it looks like a place that I would honestly never go. But. You know what? I like, I like military stuff. That's where though. you can find. And military is really huge this season for fall. So. I'm starting to think. Look at these. I feel like if I wore these with like black, maybe like tights or leggings, shorts for $19.95, I think those are gonna be super cute. This is my first time at an army surplus store and it's exactly what I thought it would be. Army stuff. So I have a way of, of measuring because I'm I don't have time. I only have 30 minutes, so see I usually take it like this, the pants, and I wrap it around my neck. And if it fits then that means it's going to fit around my waist. So it's a little tight, which probably means I might have to get another size. I already have like a majillion black tops, but these are only $7.29, so that's within my budget. Same color though, so I probably won't pick the same color. When I was growing up, my mom would wrap the pants around my neck. I felt like an idiot, but growing up I realized it's, it actually works. Did you find anything cute over here? I oh. did. I found these. These are really cute, huh? Oh my How gosh, cute are these? those are so cute. So cute, right? Oh, Michelle's beating me. She's cuter. You're so good at this, Michelle. Dude, there's like so much I can't even concentrate. Oh, cute. Now, I want like a contrasting color. So something maybe like not the same color, so maybe brown. I need shirts. I don't know where to get these shirts, but oh. I wanted that one. The smallest size you have for little me. I know this is a guy shirt, but we can make this work. Yep. Oh, sweet. Oh my gosh. We can love you. Thank you, sir. 
Okay. I found a top. I found a top. If I get a belt, I might be able to make this. Dickies. I never like going to the dressing room because I feel like usually the lines are too long. So I, I like to just try it on the spot. Oh, this is cute. Okay, I know what to do. I might have to get rid of these. These are $4.99, so I'm gonna pick up a belt. Um, probably this one, because I have a really small waist and I need one that really cinches. No, that's, no, that's not cute. This is actually a lot harder than what I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> I'm, I'm sweating bullets, seriously. All right, I'm going in the dressing room. You coming with me? Sure, let's go in. I have to get the shorts. Cause those are <laughs> My tush is too big. <gasps> Four dollars, yeah. So I think I found a complete outfit. I may have to get rid of one or two things. Yeah. I think I'm gonna get a ticket. This is like how I feel every time when I'm shopping. I'm like, do I have enough? Do I have You're over eight nine cents. So I'm gonna get rid of the shoes, but I'm gonna get a dog tag. 48.71. Here you go, kind sir. $50. Back. Let's calculate me. Okay. Let's see if I have any money left over. Forty nine sixty three. Wow! No, no, no. I'm, I'm just wearing this. My meter went up, and I think I'm getting a ticket right now. Okay. So I gotta go. Thank you so much for having me here, guys. Thank you guys so much for putting up with us Thank while you. we shopped and had a grand old time. <laughs> All right. I am done. Score. I did it. Check. Mate. When you make your big moves, be sure you always bring your best. Constructing with light, it's like a mechano set of light. To actually construct paint with light? Well, it depends on the, the source. Uh, we tended to use somewhat, you know, bare sources like we use LED tape. Um, we use various, various different sources. Like today, I know for this shoot, we've been using the most absurd sources you can possibly envisage, and it's been a very much a, an evolutionary stages um, to actually achieve the light feel we want to get. I really, really enjoy the chaos. I love the control chaos. Um, I don't mean to really reiterate that too often, but it's about the flow of things, and it's, so it's all about creating texture. Um, and you're not going to be able to get um, you know, professional sort of rental gear that's going to be able to create that. You have to create it yourself. The interesting thing about them is um, 
you know, they look absolutely ridiculous to start off with, um, and they absolutely belay the, 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 the light that they create. Um, for instance, we have this one here, which is um, really constructed from a fluorescent inspection lamp in a very similar vein, and looking you know, as blue Peter as it can possibly get is um, this sort of affair, which is a plastic jam jar full of um, red and yellow marbles uh, with strips of um, gel. We decided to take well we're shooting in Hennessy and we want the quality of light that Hennessy gives. So um, we decided to use this and um, we've shot, um, used this to create a black void yet again. Um, and we shine light through here from a from, um, light base and um, we point it towards camera because it doesn't tend to, if you go like that, it just tends to go black. You can't really, really see it glow. But as soon as you point it in that direction with the light bang, it transmits, and it transmits the color of Hennessy really, really quite well. whether or not we can actually do, perhaps break up a little less. That, that, that for me is one of, of all the ones I've seen so far, it has the most liquid feel, yeah. like, like this bit in particular. Fin de cognac. The alchemy of nature revealed in a cognac. Oh, 
Victoria Jungle. А зараз рушаємо в місто Ченду. Окрім того, що тут розташований один із найбільших та найуспішніших заповідників Пант, це ще й домівка однієї з найбільших автомобільних компаній Китаю – Джилі. Отож, проходимо повз центральний вхід і потрапляємо в місце, яке і автомобільним заводом назвати важко. Кожний автозавод просто мусить мати власний музей. І підприємство «Джилі» в місті Ченду – не виняток. Тут виставлений увесь модельний ряд марки, включаючи деякі розробки, які будуть випускатися дещо згодом. Ось, приміром, одна з них – «Джилі Лондон Кеп». Корпорація «Джилі» домовилася з владою британської столиці про постачання таких от машин, які будуть перевозити жителів та гостей Лондона. Оснащений прототип, як то кажуть, по повній програмі. Нереальна кількість вільного простору та навіть телевізор, щоб поїздка не здавалася нудною. Тут же в музеї розташований і схематичний макет самого заводу. Рухаємось зеленою алеєю в напрямку зварювального цеху. Це величезний павільйон – запустили його в роботу 2009 року. Він має площу більше 30 тисяч квадратних метрів. Тут розташовано більше 400 одиниць автоматичного та ручного обладнання. Тут народжується основа будь-якого автомобіля. Окремі кузовні панелі зі штампувального цеху прибувають сюди, і вже тут вони врешті утворюють готовий до подальшої роботи кузов і шасі. Робота на автомобільному заводі не припиняється ані на хвилину. Збирання автомобілів ведеться у три зміни – по вісім годин кожна. Налагодити повністю автоматичний процес зварювання неможливо, бо окремі елементи вимагають прийняття рішення, а комп'ютер цього робити не вміє. Всі наші агрегати розроблені в Китаї фахівцями з Шанхаю. Ми використовуємо найсучасніший метод точкового зварювання. Це найбільш швидкий та надійний спосіб скріпити дві металеві пластини. Зварені та перевірені на предмет відповідності усім геометричним стандартам кузови вирушають на фарбування, а потім на лінію кінцевого збирання. На заводі «Джилі» в Ченду вже повним ходом йде виробництво першої партії кросоверів GX-7. На виготовлення однієї машини з нуля тут необхідно близько двох годин. А загалом з конвейера кожні дві хвилини сходить новий і готовий до продажу автомобіль. Кожен з них, відповідно до всіх стандартів, має пройти одне коло тестовим треком. 
на який ми з вами зараз і вирушаємо. Тестовий трек підготовлений спеціально для випробування кросовера. Перша ділянка вкрита різноманітними перешкодами. Пральна дошка, вибоїни, горби, кам'яниста поверхня двох типів. Надалі вправа на маневрність, а потім швидкість напряма, на якій машина має розігнатися до 120 км на годину. В кінці прямого відрізку вправа на випробування гальм. І виробничий бліц-тест завершено. Журналістський тест-драйв нового кросовера Geely GX7 проходив саме на цьому полігоні. Перше коло ознайомче, тож його журналісти долали, як пасажири в салоні. За кермом сидів працівник заводу. Однак і це пасажирське враження теж важливе. GX7 має хорошу комплектацію. В салоні автомобіля, попри спеку на вулиці, панує клімат-контроль, який дуже швидко змушує забути про палюче сонце. Попрацювали китайці і над шумоізоляцією машини. Навіть на дрібних нерівностях не чутно ані відпрацювання гуми, ані гуркути деталей. Пластик інтер'єру підігнаний міцно, як ми любимо. Він не видає жодних звуків. Однак, коли машина опиняється на найбільш суворих поверхнях, камінні або вибоїнах, розумієш, на що китайці зробили найбільший акцент – підвізка. Вона згладжує практично всі нерівності, навіть при інтенсивній їзді. На прямому відрізку машина прискорюється плавно, але без провалів у потужності. Кермо достатньо інформативне, а головне – воно комфортне на дотик. Крутити таку баранку можна довго і у далеких подорожах, і у місті. Отже, підсумуємо. Кросовер Geely GX7 – новинка китайського автовиробника і його дебютний автомобіль у цьому класі. Інженерам вдалося розробити достатньо вдалий, на нашу думку, інтер'єр. Всі органи керування знаходяться під рукою, і ти розумієш обстановку одразу, як сідаєш в машину, а не після п'ятої тисячі кілометрів пробігу. Розробникам вдалося дуже вдало організувати внутрішній простір автомобіля. У ньому комфортно їхати як пасажиром спереду, так і на задньому дивані. Місця ззаду достатньо, там нарешті з'явилися окремі дефлектори системи кондиціонера. Багажник має об'єм більше 500 літрів, при цьому він достатньо глибокий і високий. Тож перевозити габаритні речі, не замовляючи собі вантажівку, власник GX7 зможе без проблем. Попереднє знайомство з цим джилі справило належне враження. Цілком імовірно, що сподівання керівництва компанії «Я впевнений, що українцям сподобається ця модель» справдяться без компромісів. Пам'ятаєте, на початку програми ми говорили про те, що автомобілі джилі народжуються на батьківщині «Пант». Ми не могли не повитріщатися на цих милих ведмедиків і дізналися про них багато нового та цікавого. Виявляється, що новонароджена панда важить усього 100 грамів, а доросла – більше 100 кілограмів. Але незалежно від віку, панда на всі 100% виправдовує свій статус найбільш лінивого створіння на цій планеті. У заповіднику нам розповіли, що за добу панда 12 годин спить, 10 годин їсть та 2 години просто гуляє. Панди – це дуже рідкісний вид, оскільки свого часу їх мало не знищили мисливці, а згодом і клімат став для них загрозою. Тому китайський уряд виділяє чимало коштів на утримання панд, бо ж вони потребують постійного і ретельного догляду. 
Хоч ці чорно-білі лінивці і хижаки, та вони люблять поласувати бамбуком. На день вони можуть його переживати до 40 кілограмів. М'ясо вони їдять в основному взимку, добувати його їм допомагають довжелезні та гострі кіфті. Вполювати собі здобич жодна панда не зледарює. А загалом ці ведмедики дуже кумедні. Щоправда, побачити панду, яка не сидить і не їсть, доволі складно, але все одно вони дуже милі. На цьому наш спеціальний репортаж добігає кінця. Як ми бачимо, китайський автопром геть не такий, яким його уявляють більшість скептиків. Подекуди китайські автозаводи навіть кращі від європейських, а їхні машини і поготів стають кращими день у день. У цьому ми з вами теж переконалися. Лишається чекати, доки побачені нами новинки з'являться в дилерській мережі групи компаній АІС, яка є офіційним дистриб'ютором автомобілів «Джилі» в Україні. begins as a whisper, a promise. The lightest of breezes dances above the death cries of 300 men. brothers of sacrifice a wind of freedom a wind of justice a wind of vengeance find a way to record our own album and, and then get a record deal or something. That would cost us so much and we can't afford that. That's exactly my point. We need to find a way to start making some real money so that we can get out of this squalor. It's always like this for first timers. You feel like, like a virgin. Yes, sir. You go better. Go better. My brother make me never tired. He go better. He go better. Nothing ever. Flipside Studios presents the musical phenomenon that defines the generation.
Flash. Hey guys, coming to you from my dining room here tonight, and I've got something a little different for you. Um, we're going to do a little science experiment, and hopefully you find it interesting. Um, this is going to utilize just common household items. And, uh, and first let me start off by saying, uh, if you're a kid, don't do this without your parents, because uh, we are utilizing a, an electrical appliance here, and there could be a malfunction with it, and you could, you know, get shocked. Uh, so definitely have your parents involved. Um, but the components you're going to need are a sheet of foil, just aluminum foil, uh, a plastic pin, and a tab off a soda can, and then as you can see just a little piece of thread there as well, and then a couple of soda cans and a couple of wires, and that's it. And you don't need any special wires, but I am using these alligator clip wires because it just makes things a little easier, okay? And what this device is going to do uh, this is using a uh, you know either a CRT type computer monitor uh, or television with the you know with the tube. Uh, this won't work on like an LCD TV or anything. Um, and <laughs> just to be safe, I'm using an old junk TV out of my garage uh, in case there would be some kind of uh, uh, you know electrical shock to the television. I don't want to burn up a good television. Uh, but anyway, basically what you're going to do is set these cans up on the television here. I mean, you can set them on the table in front of it, it doesn't really matter. And you're going to set them up like so. And then you're going to take the pin that you wrap the string around. It's got your little pendulum on there. And you're just going to lay it across these cans, okay? And you want the length about like so, okay? So it's just dangling down between the cans uh, off the ground so it's free to move around, okay? Now, then what we're going to do, uh, the whole idea behind this experiment is to show you that you can utilize this, uh, you know, like static electricity, this high voltage electricity that's coming off the screen um, to actually power something and move it, okay? And if you've ever turned one of these TVs off, which everyone has, you've heard it kind of crackle 
and uh, or if you've touched it it'll give you that little jolt and that's the electricity that we're going to utilize to make this work okay um, I'm going to go ahead and finish setting all this up because it's hard to do one-handed and then I'll turn this back on and show you how it works okay all right guys I'm back and I've got everything set up for you and let me just go over it real quickly we've got the black wire hooked up to the left can and that's our ground we've got the red wire hooked up to the right can and that's our positive side All right. we've got the plastic pin between the two cans it's plastic because we don't want it to actually transfer any electricity between the cans and then we've got the thread hanging down with the tab on it All right. now what we're going to do I'm going to take this positive terminal and hook it to the piece of foil which I've just stuck to the front of the screen there All right. and it's just hanging on by static electricity and so I'm going to clip that on there and then I'm going to ground the opposite side with my body. You can, any good ground will do. I'm just going to use my hand because my body will ground it good enough to make this work. Okay, it should be sufficient. So here, I'm going to see if I can do this with one hand. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and clip this wire onto the foil. Make sure I got a good connection there. Okay, and that's good. And then what I'm going to do is ground this and I'm going to turn the television off. And what you should see is that's going to draw that tab over and then start that motion. Okay. Let's see what happens. You can see it kind of moving in a little bit already. Okay. <laughs> and you can see how it's just kind of jumping back and forth between the cans. I had to actually slide the can in just a little bit to get it to fire up. I had the distance just a little too wide. But, and this will continue for quite some time. And as you can see, I haven't changed anything. It's just a piece of foil with the wire hooked up there. And basically it just, you know, creates the, you know, starts the electrons moving and just starts this process off. And it'll just continue to jump back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as you can see, the television's off. It's just utilizing that leftover high voltage that was on the front of the screen there. Okay. <laughs> I know this isn't the most exciting thing, so I guess we don't have to continue to watch it, but it will keep going for quite some time. Now, if I release the ground, uh, it may die down for us here, which it should, obviously. You can see it kind of slowing, okay? and slowing to a stop all right so anyway guys uh, I just thought you would find that interesting if you haven't seen anything like that before um, and like I said if, if you're a kid make sure you get your parents involved um, don't do things with electrical appliances without them around okay but uh, anyway I hope you found it interesting thanks for watching and commenting and everything I really appreciate it and I'll see you guys later bye What's up, smart? Being smart. Yep, just booked my 10th night on Hotels.com, so I get a night free. You, me, get away. Really? Where? Anywhere you want. A bed and breakfast? Bed and breakfast, check. A place by the beach? A place by awesome. Oh, you are smart. Accumulate 10 nights and get a night free. Welcome rewards from Hotels.com. Smart, so smart. It's something you're born with and lives inside you, inspires the things you choose to do, things that may not always change the world in a big way, but can change it in a million little ways. You do what you do because it matters. At HP, we don't just believe in the power of technology. We believe in the power of people when technology works for you. To do the things that matter. To dream.
to learn, to create, to work. If you're going to do something, make it matter.
Notice you weren't doing the full range of motion there, and you really gotta bring that bar all the way down to your chest. I mean, if you cheat, you only cheat yourself. Whoa, 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 sir, could you clean the bench off? I don't want ringworm, and I don't think you do either. There you go. All right, keep breathing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. In. Out. Right, there you go. Push it. Push out. Push out. Pull up hard. Push. Push. Dude, you look pretty big, but you're also a little... And I think what would help with that is a new diet. Change it up a little bit. I do the paleo diet. Got a lot of meat. Got a lot of nuts. Cuts out the complex carbs. you weren't doing the regulation ARA swing. And that's really important for proper velocity. I used to do it too, so I can... Ah! Hi, my name is Alexis Guerreros. I'm a business consultant. Today I'm gonna to be talking about company investing tips. Now, when you're deciding to purchase a share of a company, buy stock in a company, one of the things to consider is treat it as if you were buying a company down the street from where you live. Would you buy a company without doing any research? Would you purchase that company without looking into anything they've done in the past? No. You want to make sure they have a good amount of customers, they're going to be making money, and they don't have any competitors down the street that's going to be stealing your business. So the key word is research. Now, most of the companies that you're going to be buying stock from are public. So that means they make all of their information public, and that's earnings, um, any, anything, any expenses that they've had in the past, how well they're doing. You also want to consider doing research on how they stand, their sector, where they are. Is it, do you think that maybe they're coming up with a new product that's going to bring them to the top? Or are they already at the top and you think that they're going to stay there for a long time? Those are all things that you really need to consider. And again, the key word here is research. Do a lot of research because really when you buy a stock, what you want to do is buy it on the way up. So as the stock price goes up, what you love to do is buy it when it's low and sell it when it's high. And really, this is all money that you make. So again, do your research and good luck buying stock. When I'm getting ready, I usually get lazy by the time I reach my hair. I'm usually like, whatever, this looks good enough. However, Theodore thinks differently. He thinks that I'm not putting enough effort into my hair. Easy for him to say, he's just a guy. Imagine if he had super long, thick, luxurious hair like myself. Oh boy. Fun fact here. I have this useless superpower where I can break hair ties. I know some of you thick-haired viewers understand me on this one. Theodore is not only fabulous, but he's also a young entrepreneur. He created this top knot made easy by Board With Your Hair Kit, made in America. And to make this video sweeter, we'll be giving away three kits. Just watch near the end to see the contest rules. And no, Theodore did not pay me to make this video. I wanted to do it just to have fun. Alright, so he challenged me. He said that his top nut kit is so easy, even I can do it. I'm like, alright, I'll do it. The first step for the top knot is to pull your hair in a high ponytail. Yup, it's time to get that sporty spice hair. I don't think I need to show you guys how to tie a hair. I'm 
So Theodore approves, which means I'm doing something right. I'm having a Spice Girl moment here. That was a really bad British accent. Sorry. Okay, take a little brush like this guy here, and spray a little hairspray, and run the brush through your hair for a smoother surface. It's a pretty cool trick for those stubborn baby hairs. And the next step, pull. So in the kit, you get this donut-looking thingy. You could probably use a sock if you don't have this top knot kit. Just cut a hole on the bottom of the sock and roll it into a donut shape like this. Loop your hair donut into the pony, and then just create your top knot. I have a little bit of hair, so I'm gonna wrap mine a few times around. And finally, the last step, pin. You want to add bobby pins into your hair. Theodore, he included these nifty, flexible pins that are apparently stronger than regular bobby pins. I only needed two of them to hold up my bun. Look! I have a Cinnabon on top of my head! Not bad for a first try, right? Let's give it a spin. I don't know what I was doing here, but I think I wanted to see if my top knot would fall apart by shaking my head really hard. Alright, so I'm really proud of myself here. So for the contest, if you want to win a top knot hair kit, we're giving three away. It's open worldwide. First, subscribe to Theodore Leaf's channel. We'll be uploading fashion, hair, and cooking tutorials on his channel. And then, subscribe to Fawn, and of course my channel too. Once you're subscribed, just comment below saying, I'm bored with my hair. Deadline will be in the description below. And of course, music by the awesome, damn you horn, music by the awesome, David Choi. G'day guys, and welcome to Aussie Griller. Now today, I'm going to show you how I make a delicious meatball sub sandwich. Now guys, this is very easy to make and it is absolutely awesome. Here I've got a tasty foot long bread roll. Some shredded pizza cheese. 500 grams of beef mince some homemade pizza sauce. Now I have done a video on how to make this guys. I've put the link to this in the description bar. You can also use your favorite pasta sauce as well here, up to you. And here I've got some tasty toppings. Pick your favorite toppings here. I've got some red onions, some olives and some jalapenos. Here I've got half a brown onion finely diced, a couple of cloves of garlic and some fresh oregano leaves which I've chopped up. Also want a bit of salt and pepper and some oil. Now I'm going to start by crushing those garlic cloves into the beef mince. Adding the brown onion and the oregano. About a half teaspoon of pepper and a half teaspoon of salt and about a handful of that shredded pizza cheese now you can use parmesan here too if you want guys mix well and then just roll them into meatballs I'm making mine a bit under golf ball size your choice though guys, just remember they do have to fit into the roll though. Now once that's done, I'm going to put them into the freezer for 20 minutes. This will help them hold together when you cook them. Now for the bread roll here, I'm just going to cut out a V-shaped groove from the top to fit the fillings in. Now over a hot barbecue, I'm going to cook up those meatballs in a pan. 
I've only got charcoals on one side of the barbecue here, guys. So when it gets a bit hot, just move it to the other side. Control your temperature. Now once they're browned, I'm gonna add in that pizza sauce. Mix well and allow it to cook just for a few minutes until the meatballs are cooked through. Then it's just a case of putting together the sandwich. Meatballs in first, followed by your toppings. And then covered in that shredded pizza cheese. Now I've got this cooking guys on the indirect side of the barbecue. You can use an oven if you like or a griller. Similar sort of idea. And after about five minutes, this is what you have guys. It is absolutely fantastic. Make sure you check it out. For more information on this recipe or to see my others, please visit the Aussie Griller website or the Aussie Griller page on Facebook. Luck. We, we all know hard work's essential, discipline's essential, staying power's essential, but there's that element there that you can't quantify, but you know it's there. Warren, you, you, you've had some thoughts. Well, there's a lot of luck. I mean, I, mm -hmm. uh, just being born in the United States in 1930, the odds were like 30 to 1 against me. I mean, you know, it, uh, uh, I didn't have anything to do with picking the United States <laughs> as I emerged. And having decent genes for certain things, and in my own case, I was sort of wired for capital allocation, and being wired for capital allocation a couple of hundred years ago in Nebraska wouldn't have meant a thing. Uh, and, and even now, being born in various parts of the world, it wouldn't have meant much. But here I was in this soon-to-be very rich capitalistic system, and, and it just so happened that what I did paid off enormously in a market system like we have. And I, if I'd had a talent in some other area that was way less commercial. I mean, I would, have, I would have had a good time doing it, but it wouldn't have paid off like this. But of course, Jay said it perfectly when he talked about, you know, he's in there recording for himself and the money comes afterwards. I mean, I, I got to do what I love. I mean, and 
it doesn't get any luckier than that. If, 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 if an, you can spend your lifetime, and I'm 80 now, and doing things you love every single day. I mean, I, I would be doing what I did, what I do now, and I would have done it in the past if the payoff had been in seashells or shark's teeth or anything else. It, it, if you can go to work every morning, I tap dance to work, you know, and I come down, and I, I, every day's exciting. Uh, so that is lucky. I mean, that didn't have to happen that way. If I'd been born in 1930, if I'd been born a female, if I'd been born black, I would not have had the same opportunities that, that I had. I mean, I, it's just it's chance. I mean, I, my, my parents loved my sisters just as much as they loved me. My sisters are just as smart or smarter than I am and all of that, but they didn't have the same expectations uh, in the 30s for, for a, a, a young, smart girl, for a young, smart guy. And so I, I've had all kinds of luck. I had the luck of, I got turned down by Harvard. Well, getting turned on down by Harvard, then I got to study under Ben Graham at Columbia, which changed my life. I, all kinds of things have worked out. So I just hope I stay lucky. <laughs> I've been lucky for 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, where, where you grew up, you could have easily have uh, yeah. ended up, as you discussed with your friends who uh, did something, and by golly, they, they were put away and didn't get yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, there are very few people that, from my neighborhood, you know, in my environment, that make it out, uh, I mean, forget about being to be successful, to make it out alive, you know, or, or, or to be um, incarcerated, you know, for the, I have a great friend, you know, who just came home, he was one of the most beautiful people you ever meet, you know, and he's, you know, he just came home from doing 13 years, and we were, we were together every single day, you know, and had it not been for music, and um, music taking me out, you know, at the right time, you know, my life could very easily have been his, very easily, we were together every single day. Well, men mention you know. the story about London. You yeah, so, um, they, they did, you know, we were into different things. We were into a lot of uh, street things. And, um, you know, just so happened I had a talent to make music. And um, a guy by the name of Jazz, um, who I started out with really early, you know, he got a, the opportunity, he got to deal with EMI. He had the opportunity to go to London to record um, his album. And, uh, you know, I went along with him and we, we waited for two months. Well, in that two months, there was a sting operation. And he took, you know, my friend I'm talking about, he took him away for 13 years. And the only reason I was in there because I was away, you know, uh, doing this music stuff. There's no business cards shouldn't just be used for business because we can use it in our makeup routine. It's a great tool for all things makeup. You can use it like this to create a straight edge for your brows especially if you don't have an angled brush. Or you can use it for your brow pencil to create the right angles. My other favorite trick, using it to create the perfect cat eyes. You want to place the corner of the card on your eyes first to help create that sharp edge. And then fill it in with any eyeshadow color of your choice. You can also use gel or cream eyeliners. From here, just build up the shape until you've achieved the cat liner shape of your choice. Time for mascara. I'm sure some of you have already seen this trick. I like to use the card as a shield for my lids. It actually helps protect them from accidental mascara marks. Place them behind your lashes and give your lashes a few good swipes. You'll also notice that you'll end up with more product on your lashes. And if you want to coat and line your lower lashes, you can do it at the same time with your card. Place the card right below the lower lashes and brush it back and forth. The last trick, contouring with your card. And with your card, line it up to your ear. And brush your bronzer on like this. And then just remove the card. Notice the line you just created? It's a foolproof way to contour your face. And now, just soften up the sharp edge by blending it out.
And now, your entire face is finished. All thanks to the good old trusty business card. Thumbs up if you guys would like me to film a tutorial on how I evened out my eyelids without surgery. Good luck everyone! Music by Neon Hitch. Gold. Hi guys! Do you need new ways to wear your scarf? I'll show you some easy steps on how to take your scarf to the next level. I recommend using a large rectangle scarf. For the first look, take the two corners of your scarf and tie them together. And look, you have a hole for your arm. Repeat the same step to the other side. Tie the other two corners together and put your arm through that hole too. You've just created the angel sweater. It's a very flowy scarf look that will keep you warm and covered up. For the next look, keep the scarf behind you as if you're drying your butt with a towel and bring the two top corners together. Tie them together and pull the knot closer to your body like this. And now you have a dress. Make two knots and just wrap the two ends behind your back. Secure this dress by tying the two corners together. And now your sweetheart dress is complete. It's a sweet and sassy dress that looks nothing like a scarf. Perfect for going out. For this look, again, pull the two top corners together, but instead of wrapping the other two ends around your chest like the sweetheart look, tie it up like this to create a halter top. So all that I need. Make sure it's secure and snug, or else you're going to make a lot of boys happy. This is called the resort. It's perfect for the beach or poolside. Just don't wear this during the dead of winter. For the next look, find the middle part of your scarf, and with the corner end, tie it to the middle part of your scarf. Flip it over to the other end on the same side, and again, tie the corner and middle part together. And now, your new cape is ready. This cape crusader look is perfect for a night out. A crime fighting night, of course. Take your fabulous scarf, and with one end, make a knot. Your heart is lighting me. Do the same on the other end. Now you have a halter top. Tie it around your neck, kind of like an apron. And twist it around once. And wrap it around your waist to secure it in place. Bam! Your boho look is done. I told you it was easy. It's the perfect casual dress to wear. The awesome scarf that I used in this video is by Theodora and Callum. If you guys would like to see more ways on transforming your scarf, please thumbs up. Oh, and don't worry, I'll still be creating makeup tutorials and will definitely be uploading more next week. Good luck. Music by Mari Digby. Special thanks to the Mondrian Hotel for letting me borrow their fabulous room. I really needed a place with a good view for this video. It's all that I need.
LeBron just tweeted he's addicted to Unicorn Apocalypse. Are you serious? Wow. Tyler, give me Danish. I want to celebrate. I can't. These are for a meeting the guys are having with the director. Wait, they're making Unicorn Apocalypse into a movie? Yeah, right. Like someone's going to want to make a movie about zombie unicorns. Oh, my God. That's Tim Burton. Yeah, that's Mr. Burton. Oh. Hey, Jared. Nice to meet you. Well, I don't think we can afford him. Tim, I gotta say, we're really excited that you like our game. This is all the kind of stuff I love, you know? Zombies, unicorns, the apocalypse. Did you guys know that unicorns are basically goats? What are you doing? I'm uh, just tweaking my buddy cop script. I'm gonna slip it to Tim. Tyler, you and Tim Burton have the same haircut. You think? Yeah. And the movie's called Unicorn Apocalypse, Horn of Darkness. Yes. Cool. I had some thoughts. Here's the hero. This amazing little unicorn, Hornelius. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> what do you guys think they're talking about in there? Probably the role of the protagonist in a traditional hero's journey. Zombie unicorns on one side, what's left of humanity on the other. Unicorns attack, start killing everybody. <laughs> you know, humans fight back, spilling unicorn blood, which is like rainbow colored with little weird sparkles in it. People run out of provisions. They have to eat each other to survive. And eyes are bulging out of their heads. Yes, yeah, planets are smashing into each other. Bold and all just oh, Guys, this is getting a little too weird for me. Get more done on the Galaxy Note 10.1 with safe technology. Like that. You don't like the smell of mechanic, but you like the, to eat the money of mechanic. Thank you, you. jealous. <laughs> Who else? My man. Oh, come on, see. I mean, he's just so sweet, adorable, kind. He treats me like a lady. He's a gentleman, of course. I mean, I love him. Or I haven't told him yet, but I think he's in. All right, hold up a minute, man. Now, if you want to sell something to a married man, this here is your man. You messing with a married man? Who's married? You're supposed to be my wife. I should have married a Leopard. Everything he buys from you, he gives to his mistresses. His wife gets nothing but gets beat down every second. I mean, you know I'm, you know I'm the man. Oh, shut up. You man. know I'm the man. Give me my money back right now. Where's the money? Like, give me back my money right now. What if your daughter is the problem? She might be the one that is the problem. It's the way life goes with women, they never listen. I've never seen somebody that I cannot communicate with. I've never seen somebody that everything I do is wrong. Ajegule is not like that at all. He helps me with everything. Even between him and I, I'm the bad one. He needs to lose that stomach that covers the machine gun. Bullet point noted, my sister. See, I love it when fools like this want to know about marriage. We get along because I know that marriage is a give and take. God, they said if I end up together, I pray together. Right here is a married man. Breadwinner, responsible and all that. All I see here 
is a bona fide loser. I'm looking for the stupid wedding ring. You may want to check where you slept last night. Who ring is this? What are you talking about, Tyrone? Oh, man. Oh, is that how it is? At least he puts orange juice in my refrigerator. Your bum ass comes and drinks it all up. Why is Kumasi? Come on. Why is Kumasi? He has the nerve to choke my daughter. When was the last time you slept in your house? Do you expect me to answer that question? How can you look at a man like me? A real man, the man. And then you asked me when was last time I slept in my house. I just want to see Kumasi. He got my daughter pregnant. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> You're probably going to have a retarded baby. Anyway. Kumasi is ugly. I want a divorce. I don't want to see him in this life ever again. I'm sorry, I was stupid. That's what's wrong with you, women. Huh? You weren't already made. You want me to get up? Jesus, oh, get up. Jesus Christ, my God, please. Where y'all want me to start it? Audio Jungle